be here. Well, thank you, Katarina, and thank you to the organizers, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. So listen, to conclude these two extraordinary webinars, we have a special guest and who is going to give an honorary lecture on, um, on the CORSAF2 vaccines. And uh, I know that Dan doesn't really need an introduction because he's very well known in the, uh, among the experts of all the fields that we've been covering today with these two webinars. However, it is my great pleasure and great honor to introduce Dan Culver to you. So Dan is the director of the Interstitial Lung Diseases Program in um, Cleveland's Clinic's main campus. And he's also very much involved in um, intensive care and also in uh, pathophysiology. On top of that, he's the president-elect of the WASOG and very, very active in this association. He's also the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board of the uh, Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. On top of this, and I don't know how he has time to do all of this, he is uh, from the very beginning of the uh, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. He's been very much involved in his management and he's in research about probably treatments, but moreover vaccines. So uh, Dan, thank you so much to share your thoughts in work with us about this. And please tell us if we are far from getting the vaccine, you know, from the next door drugstore. Thank you, Dan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dominique. Uh, let me try to do what I can do to share my screen here. Okay. Is that working now? Good. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. Thank you, um, uh, Katarina and the organizing committee for the invitation. Uh, this is truly an honor. Uh, I am not a vaccine expert. I am not an infectious disease doctor. I was minding my own business until this uh, pandemic happened. Uh, and in fact, today I am rounding in the uh, medical intensive care unit, and I'm happy to tell you, at least in Ohio, that I had no COVID patients to take care of on my particular ward. Uh, so I think that's uh, probably going to change by tomorrow, but on this particular day, there were no COVID patients admitted in my ICU. Um, so I'm going to just take a few minutes and talk about vaccines. This is, of course, where we would all like things to go. Uh, I have much less data than the last speaker. And really what I'd like to do is talk a little bit, a bit about principles and about how this is being approached uh, more than about uh, particular data. We don't, we don't see the slides, please. You have to share the screen. There is a green circle with a narrow, and you have to, put to, to click on that in order to share your slides, please. Take a brief and uh, we have time for you. Just uh, be relaxed and uh, do it. Just right, to share see. the screen, the green like one. Sure. You will see your desktop and open the, the presentation. Now, let's see. That's the bottom of the screen. The green. That says it should be sharing. Yes, it should be. Oh, here, there's a blue sharing button. Yes. Okay. That? Yes. That right. Yeah. 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 Go. Thank Go you. On now. Thank you. Okay. Well, I have to show you my picture of the vaccine. Um, okay. So, this SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually probably a good target for a vaccine uh, in some ways. Uh, it's a very large RNA virus. It has a fairly stable genome. Uh, it undergoes a recombination, but it has a pretty high fidelity uh, uh, transcription. And, and in fact, um, it has uh, several proteins which have very good homology across different coronaviruses, especially the spike protein, and in particular, the receptor binding domain. 
And so uh, it's natural that most groups have chosen the spike protein as the major target for vaccines. Um, uh, in fact, if you look at uh, SARS-CoV-1 and look at patients who've recovered from that and look at the epitopes that their B cells or uh, an antibodies recognize or that the T cells recognize, uh, these are fairly conserved compared to SARS-CoV-2. And so the thought is that uh, if a vaccine can be developed, uh, that it's likely to have some efficacy. That doesn't speak about the durability of immunity, but at least the notion that immunity could be garnered if an effective vaccine can be developed. Um, now, the WHO has a very nice website, and let me put this on the slideshow, sorry. The WHO has a very nice website uh, that goes through all of these, and anybody who's interested in more, I encourage you to go to it. There are a whole bunch of people in this game right now trying to develop a vaccine, and hopefully more than one will actually come out of this. And so, in fact, there are 128 vaccines in the latest count that are in development, and 13 of those have moved into clinical trials. And of course, this is very nice because it gives us a good shot on goal, and everybody thinks that they're going to have a good shot on goal, but just like a good football match, uh, you have to take a lot of shots on goal against a good goalie, and so a nice shot like that may not go in. Maybe the next vaccine on a PK has a little better chance of going in. Uh, maybe you need a very fancy one, like a, a bicycle kick or something, to really make a, a successful vaccine happen. Uh, and then finally, um, and this is actually the US goalkeeper getting beaten, uh, maybe finally one will find the back of the net. And that's what we're all hoping for. In fact, we're hoping for a lot of vaccines to find the back of the net with success. Um, vaccine development is happening very, very fast, just like clinical trials. This is moving much more quickly than, than the norm. Uh, the traditional timeline I have listed on the top, and of course we would go through the normal phases of preclinical development and then these trials. And in the phase one trial, typically we would of course be looking at um, testing out the ability to generate an immune response and mostly looking at safety. In the phase two trial, which in many cases now is overlapping with phase one, in general, you would be looking at dose finding, whether booster is necessary, and getting more data in terms of the magnitude of immune response. And then finally, a phase three trial doesn't require serologic or cell mediated data. It really requires you to go in and look to see if you prevent the disease from developing. And so the phase three trial is what many of these companies are moving towards starting by the end of the year. Uh, and in fact, um, those are already get planned for starting. And so phase three trials involve in general thousands and thousands of patients. You can see that in the current timeline that there's been a telescoping of these phases. Uh, uh, there's uh, manufacturing getting started already for a number of these vaccines on top of the phase two and phase three trials. And we're hopeful that by the end of 2020, we'll start to at least get the beginnings of readouts on some of these. I think that's a slightly ambitious uh, timeline, but in reality, the timing of that will depend on where the vaccines are tested and the rate of infection in the areas where they're tested. So if you don't have infections, you won't be able to demonstrate that there is a benefit to the vaccines. One thing before we get into the specific vaccines is to talk about nonspecific vaccination. And so there are several proposals to use other vaccinations to augment immunity. Perhaps many of these work by augmenting interferon signaling and providing what's so-called viral interference, where if you get one viral infection because of augmented immunity, a second viral infection is less likely to happen. And I just highlighted three of them here. One that's come up is the oral polio va vaccine. And in fact, this is something that uh, has been an observation for decades and decades. And that is that an enterogenic vaccine that induces immunity to oral polio, if given before uh, influenza season in Russia, was shown to reduce the incidence of symptomatic influenza quite a bit. And so there is an effort at University of Maryland, among others, to look at OPV as a potential way until a specific vaccine can be developed. Another one that's interesting, and there are some interesting epidemiologic data in favor of it, is MMR. And, and uh, populations where many of the adults have been vo 
uh, reboosted or vaccinated against MMR seem to have lower rates of COVID infection. And so in fact, there's at least one study that I'm aware of at University of Cairo looking at MMR vaccination as a way to help prevent the development of uh, COVID uh, infection. And then finally, the one you've probably heard the most about is the BCG. There are also epidemiologic data suggesting BCG vaccination can uh, uh, antagonize or decrease the chance of later infections. And so there are several trials uh, underway looking at BCG vaccination as a way to antagonize the development of or protect against the development of COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned, there are a few issues when we think about clinical trials in COVID-19. Uh, one of them that's going to really have to do with the speed of this is what's the infection rate. And I know many of the companies are looking very closely at that as they decide where to conduct their clinical trials. If you have a low infection rate, clinical trial is going to take a lot longer and going to need a lot more patients. And so they want to go to places that have high infection rates as they do these phase three trials. Another issue that I think is very difficult, and it depends on how good our serologic tests are, is the notion of asymptomatic infection. So as you design a clinical trial, if there's a high population of pe people who were previously asymptomatically infected, but who now have immunity, those may be very difficult to show a benefit of the vaccine. So background seropositivity is the second clinical trial issue. Then you have to think about how do we assess the effectiveness of it? Do you use some kind of serologic marker? Do you find some screening so you can look for asymptomatic infections? Or do you wait until somebody becomes symptomatic and gets a conventional RT-PCR in order to confirm infection? And, and the last issue I'll bring up is the issue of how much immunity do you need to show in these clinical trials? Do you need to show that you just don't develop symptoms? Do you need to show that you can develop an effective and neutralizing antibody response? Or do you need true sterilizing immunity whereby you would not become asymptomatically infected and you would not be able to shed virus at all. And in fact, if you do a conventional parenteral administration uh, like a shot, you may not develop sterilizing immunity because of the immune compartment not targeting the upper airways epithelium the way, for example, a nasal vaccine would do where sterilizing immunity might be more likely. I think most people think sterilizing immunity is probably not necessary to reach our goals of vaccination, but that's another issue to think about as you read about some of these trials. So here are the 13 that are in, that are in trials right now, as far as I know. Uh, you can see that some of them are pretty far along. The University of Oxford AstraZeneca partnership is already in phase two and three, phase three trials. There are a number that are in phase two or phase one slash two trials, and then a number that are just doing phase one trials right now. And these really rely on five different kinds of approaches. There's a uh, conventional inactivated viruses. There's also attenuated viruses, which are not in trials yet. There are viral vectors. And for example, the University of Oxford group uses a chimpanzee adenovirus vector in which the spike protein is expressed in order to, vit to get into the cell and then generate immunity. Uh, there are other viral vectors that are there. And then there are protein proteins. Uh, the only one that's going on right now is Novavax, which uses nanoprotein particles along with an adjuvant. But in fact, protein platforms are the most common out of the 128 that are in development. Proteins are roughly half of those. So you're going to see a lot of protein vaccines coming down the pike. Finally, there are DNA and RNA vaccines. Those have not been used yet, uh, but those I think are some of the ones that are the furthest along. So those are the ones that are in trial right now. And you can see this is really truly a worldwide effort. So what about these platforms? Uh, here, are, here are the platforms that uh, have been proposed and they have some pros and cons. Uh, for example, the conventional ones which are on the top uh, have been widely used. We know that they can be quite effective. They induce very strong immune responses, but there are some challenges to those. Inactivated viruses sometimes can induce eosinophilic reactions if the, if the uh, lymphocyte populations that respond to it are not balanced between Th1 and Th2. Um, these also require a cold storage chain, so you have to be able to account for the shipping and handling of the viruses or of the vaccines as you ship it around. So that's a little bit more difficult. They also take a little longer to manufacture to scale. So these are all issues which may have uh, uh, 
complications for those particular platforms. Viral vectors we talked about a little bit. I want to just point out one potential problem with viral vectors, and that is that uh, at least in the cam sino uh, um, experience, if you had previous immunity to adenovirus, then your response to the adenoviral vector with the spike protein seems to be attenuated. And so populations that have responses against the adenovirus will probably have less effective immune responses to the vaccinations. I suspect that the Oxford Jennings Institute vaccine may get around that a little bit because they have a chimpanzee adenovirus, uh, but we'll have to see if that's the case. Uh, protein vaccines have their own issues. They're very, very safe. You can make them really fast, uh, but you have to give an adjutant to, to, to induce immunogenicity, which introduces another complication in the manufacturing, distribution, and cost. Uh, DNA vaccines, uh, much newer technology, easy to produce, quite stable. You can ship them all over the place, uh, but they're also not as immunogenic. Um, and so, uh, whether or not you develop sufficient immunity is not clear. And it's hard to deliver DNA into cells. How do you get the cells to take up the DNA? And so you have to, for example, use electroporation devices to get it in. RNA vaccines are, are, are the big hot one. Um, they're easy to make. Uh, they were uh, uh, designed very quickly uh, after the viral genome was sequenced. Um, one of the things that's nice compared to DNA vaccines is that there's no risk of them integrating into the genome, right? They're just sitting out there, uh, taken up uh, in the cytosol and transcribed there. And in fact, there's a nifty little uh, um, uh, uh, version of those in which a, repli a replicase is inserted into the construct, which allows the RNA to self-amplify, which allows you to use lower doses of the RNA vaccine and the advantage of that, I think, is that it's much more scalable. You could produce many more doses and serve much more of the world more quickly. RNA vaccines sound great, but so far none of them have been used. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about RNA vaccines. As you look at the literature and as you think about these, you'll realize that they're not all the same. There's some complexity to this. So first is the construct. And of course, you could have something like a spike protein uh, here. And then um, you have to have some other pieces in the construct and how that's done really is going to modify uh, the dose that's necessary and the immunogenicity that you get. So the five prime and three prime untranslated regions are very important. The five prime cap is very important for stability and so is the poly A tail. And if all of these things are not optimized, balancing manufacturing capacity, fidelity, versus the, 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 the duration the RNA can last in the cell, then you have a problem. The other thing you could do is between this green and this blue, you could put in a replicase. And what happens is then, is when the, when the uh, construct enters into the cell, actually the RNA leaks out of the endosome, becomes free in the cytosol, it gets taken up by cytosolic ribosomes, and in fact, that could then transcribe a viral replicase which then can grab onto RNA and start making more copies of itself and transcribing the mRNA construct, which then allows an amplification of a lot of the spike protein. And so the number of spike proteins that then associate with type one MHC molecules for expression is much higher. And you may not need then a priming boost, which again allows you perhaps to double or nearly double the number of people who can be served with your viral vaccine. As you look through some of these papers, there's some things to think about when you look at the vaccine efficacy. Uh, one are the kinetics of the antibody response. How fast does it happen? How robust is it? Does it get to a level that really is consistent with people who have recovered from SARS-CoV-2? You want to see that in the papers. And then we don't know that much about the durability of any of these. So far, nothing's been reported in the literature of which I'm aware that really suggests that any of these leads to durable responses. And in fact, there was just a paper this week in Nature Medicine that suggested that a number of patients in Wuhan who had recovered from uh, SARS-CoV-2, in fact, had waning of their antibody levels uh, uh, by significant amounts just after eight weeks after recovery. You want to know about the components of what, what's being produced. Is it IgM? Is it IgG? What IgG subtype is it? Certain ones are going to be more prone to induce Th2 responses versus Th1 responses. 
And then you want to look very carefully to make sure not only do you have titers, but you actually also have neutralizing titers. And you'll usually see uh, plaque neutralization assays, which allow you to say that you can actually block the virus using these antibodies. If you don't have neutralizing antibodies, there are some risks to just having nonspecific antibodies out there. Finally, we don't know how important humoral versus cell-mediated immunity is. And so you want to be able to see that there's an LA spot or some other way of measuring cell-mediated immunity in order to assess that your vaccine is actually effective. And there's a risk to not doing this well, and I'll outline a couple of those. One is that uh, you could get antibodies that are sitting out there, but perhaps they're not good enough to stop the virus. That brings up this thing that's mostly been shown in dengue and Zika, which is called antibody dependent enhancement. And the idea is that if you have antibodies that can bind the virus, but that they don't neutralize the virus, they don't kill it, and they don't neutralize it from binding to the uh, uh, ACE2 receptor, those can be bound then also to cells that express the FC receptor taken up and that augments the viral infection. This is probably less of a risk with, with COVID-19 because uh, uh, these FC receptors are, are mainly not expressed very, very much on the, on the cells that the uh, virus infects, but it's a theoretical risk if you have antibodies that really aren't very effective at killing the virus. The other thing that I think is a little bit more of a risk is this idea that I brought up of eosinophilic activation. And that is that if you don't stimulate a balanced Th1 and Th2 response, and in fact, this is better by some of these agents like RNA or some of the adjuvants or some of the uh, uh, um, ways of uh, uh, ligating toll receptors, uh, you will end up with something that's primarily a Th2 response. And this has been shown to be effective, for example, in animal models of SARS-CoV-1, where certain vaccinations induced hyperinflammation in the lung on re-exposure to the virus. So this is a very important theoretical risk that you want to make sure when you read these papers is being attended to by the people who are actually doing the studies. Finally, we think, oh, well, we finally got a vaccine, now we're home free, but that's not the last step. Now we have to actually do all these steps that are on the bottom of this. We've only gotten to here once we develop a vaccine that looks good in the phase three trial. And so we need to get to manufacturing, we need to assess quality control, and we need to think about distribution. And these are things that I think that all the companies are thinking about, but many of them are far, far behind on thinking about how they're going to scale this in a way that ensures adequate quality. And I think that this is very important as we think about this as being a worldwide pandemic because there are certain countries that are the haves and other that are actually the have nots. So these are some data that show the vaccine manufacturing capacity now either in red in the, in the well-established places or the emerging ones. And you can see a lot of countries here in the world are at risk of being left out of vaccine manufacturing. And I didn't know this before I got into this, but Belgium actually makes the most number of doses of vaccine annually uh, um, uh, 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 up to uh, until India, the Serum Institute of India passed it up recently. But vaccine production is everybody is looking to get their hands on vaccine first and keep it for their own country. And so there are some people thinking about, you know, how do we make this a worldwide solution? Because I think only a worldwide solution is really going to prevent the spread of this so it doesn't come back in and keep infecting more people. And in fact, there are some efforts to ensure broad access, and I think we should all try to support those. There is the uh, Gavi Vaccine Alliance, which is trying to obtain advanced market commitments uh, for people to distribute their vaccines broadly after developing them. And they're putting money to these manufacturers and then getting these guarantees. There's inclusive vaccine alliance. And then there's finally a thing that hasn't caught on very much. I think the only European ones that have signed on are Norway and Portugal, which is this COVID-19 technology access pool where everybody will share their data, they'll share what they do, and they'll try to advance this across the world. And I just put one example here to show you know, these countries, especially in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, which are just even for something as simple as DPT, really have very low vaccination rates. And if, if we don't deal with this problem, we're going to have reservoirs of this, which are liable to rebound and come back on us. So I think that's enough for now. I know it's getting late there. 
I want to say thank you very much. And I, I feel very optimistic that we will have at least one ball, if not more than one ball in the back of the net, uh, if we have this conference again next year. Thank you.